Good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. On behalf of the store, we're pleased to welcome Jen Bain and Trin Gertano in support of Friendshipping. Uh, you heard me as you came in, but I'll go over our overview of, oh, cool, there's the books. <laughs> our overview of webinars one more time for you, for those of you who are joining us late. The chat is closed on the webinar, but you might want to keep the chat window open during the event as I will be dropping links to purchase Friendshipping from Literati. And there is a link in the description below if you are watching us later on YouTube. You can submit questions for the Q&A if you're watching live using the Q&A feature available to you at any time. And I will read a selection of those questions at the conclusion of the conversation. And as a reminder, you can also shop for thousands of more books at literatibookstore.com. Books are available, select books are available for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan or the greater Ann Arbor area. And we will ship any book that you can find on our website to you in, at your home anywhere in the United States. In lieu of a book purchase, uh, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So whether you'd like to think of that as this week's uh, subscription to our events or this month's or subscription for 2021, although hopefully we won't be virtual for that whole span, um, you can make a donation at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we th simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us from. So without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's guest, Jen Bain, is a comedy writer, editor, producer, and co-host of the podcast, Friendshipping, a feel-good advice show about making friends. She lives in Chicago with her husband, and Trin Giertano is a game dev, writer of tabletop games, and the other half of the Friendshipping podcast. They can't hear you, but please, at home, uh, join me in a round of applause and welcoming Trin and Jen into your living rooms. We can hear it. We can hear it. We can feel it. We can hear it in our souls is where we can hear it. Yeah. So Jen, <laughs> here we are. Here we are. On the internet to talk about our book. And this is not foreign territory to us. We are constantly talking on the internet, it, as it turns out. Uh, almost every week, uh, every Thursday, Trin. What happens every Thursday? Every Thursday, we, rec we have the release of podcast episode. Sorry it took me so long to get there because we, <laughs> we, do we don't record on Thursdays. We release the episode into the wild, like like letting the dolphin free into the sea on friendshipingpodcast.com. So if you want to, uh, honestly, if you want to learn literally anything about us, you could go to friendshipingpodcast.com and, and find out that information. Jen, we love the Midwest United States. We're both from the Midwest, lived in the Midwest our entire lives. So yeah. we have real fondness for bookstores that are uh, there. I also really like Ann Arbor. So we're super happy to be here and super happy to be uh, promoting our book. And promoting a book is a weird thing to do um, because I personally don't like, I'm a terrible salesperson and I don't like telling people to spend money on things. Um, however, I feel <laughs> much less guilty about asking people to spend money at independent bookstores. Um, and I also like our book for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, li I like our book and I'm, I'm excited to, to talk a little bit about it. Yeah, same, same Z's. Yeah, writing this book was a, a weird, weird labor of love uh, with me and Jen. Um, the way that the whole thing got started was, as we mentioned, we have a podcast and it's a podcast about friendship. It's called Friendshipping. And uh, we give advice every week to... Uh, people from the internet you can email us at friendshipingpodcast at gmail.com and uh we what we do is we uh kind of dissect the problem we um, look at it as from as many angles as we possibly can and we draw upon our vast wide enormous and immense foundation of fuck-ups in our lives <laughs> yes. and and uh and we try and help you do a little bit better you know um and and this book is that it, it's, it's um every week we we would put together these these notes before we record because we care very much and we want to do a good job and so now we had like a billion trillion huge amounts of notes uh that barely made sense uh, but we thought to ourselves what if we made it into a book and then we did do that and here we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we uh, we started our podcast in 2015. 
um, which feels so long. It feels, it feels like lifetimes ago now, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, but uh, we were really surprised and flattered when we start receiving questions in our inbox. Uh, people would ask us things like, uh, my favorite question, I think this is such a compelling modern question, uh, is it okay to unfollow my friend on Twitter? Yeah. People ask us about friend breakups. Um, and it kind of showed, Trin and I, it showed us just how universal friendship concerns really are. And also we, we started to notice that uh, there's a lot of advice available about romantic relationships. Like that's a pretty common topic, but we were, uh, it's a little harder to find uh, advice about platonic relationships. So that's, that's kind of what uh, we were, we're trying to, trying to fill that gap. Um, and like Trin said, it's not like we're experts. We don't have like any degrees in friendship or psychology or anything like that. It's more like through years of mistakes and therapy and caring a lot. Uh, this is just to topic. Um, I almost said it comes naturally to us, but that's not true. It does not, nothing comes naturally to Trin. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, it's, it's like, more like we work really hard and uh, put a lot of notes together and I have a thousand pages of Google Docs and that's what this is with a lot of editing. Yeah, absolutely. And I, Jen, I'm really glad that you brought up like a lot of our experience comes from just being weird people with therapists in the world, you know, because we're all just kind of like, you know, driving these meat mechs around, bumping into each other, trying to do our best. Uh, and we try to take a lot of different perspectives into consideration when we answer our questions. So mental health, um, how we are feeling based on our confinement in the pandemic, um, how we are feeling based on uh, the loneliness of not hearing from our friends as much because they're probably prioritizing self-care. Um, we try to think about all of those things. Uh, we try to think about the, the both the person who asked the question and the person that that person is complaining about because you know <laughs> maybe the person has a point. Um, I love that we touched on that we're both Midwesterners because uh, we have also found that uh, people's personalities can sometimes uh, be different based on region. Um, we talk about that a lot in our book. Um, you know, us Midwesterners, we are very uh, we, we are very timid people. We're timid people. Yeah, <laughs> we, ref we refuse to make um, you do anything for us, even if we are in dire need. Uh, right. Yeah, Midwesterners uh, will shovel the sidewalk and they will um, get you groceries, but uh, they will not do things like ask you for a glass of water or yes. if a waiter brings you the, or if a server brings you the wrong meal, you'll just eat the meal. Oh, so yeah. there's a section in our book, um, we should talk about that. I think it's an interesting topic. Um, yeah, let's do it. Um, and uh, just to preview the rest of this, Trin and I are gonna talk about the book. We're gonna, I think we're gonna do a reading at some point where we're gonna do a reading about long distance friends straight from the book. And then um, for the last 15 minutes of the hour, we're going to take some questions and we'll take questions about friendship. We'll take questions about what it's like to write a book. Um, we'll take wh whatever's on your mind. We'll do our best to answer. Um, like we already gave the disclaimer that we're not experts, um, but it turns out you don't have to be an expert to write a book. So oh, yeah. all you got to do is like talk. Yeah. <laughs> if you could talk, you can write. So that's where we are. Okay. What were we going to talk about? Oh, ask versus guest culture. Uh, so this is a concept that was uh, first coined by Andrea Dondari on the um, Metafilter platform. Uh, and what Andrea had found was that uh, people tend to fall loosely into two different camps when it comes to asking for things that they need. So there's ask culture and guest culture. An ask culture is the kind of person who will ask for whatever they need. And if they get a no, it's like, whatever, cool. I'm glad that you made your needs known. I can move along with my day NBD. Uh, and a guest culture is one well, the Midwesterners uh, that we were talking about. Uh, the guest culture is we will not ask for anything unless we know with nigh certainty that we will get a yes, because a no is very painful. It feels like we've put that person out. Um, and there's no right or wrong way to be. So for um, an ask culture person, they tend to get the things that they want. They tend to get the help that they need. They sometimes can come off as pushy um, and they sometimes they'll bump heads with guest culture people, but there's nothing wrong with being that way. And guest culture people, while we may come off as like very polite, have very good etiquette, being very you know, self-supporting, we don't get the help we need and we miss opportunities. And we, when we don't ask for things, uh, then our friends can't help us. And that's, that's not good either. Um, so what we try to do is find some kind of place in the middle uh, where we take a little bit of both, you know? Like, yes, I think it probably is important to consider if I ask my friend if I can crash at their house for a week, 
Will that make them feel so uncomfortable that they are forced to say yes? Or will they be delighted by my presence? You know, like these are these are things that I think are, are good to consider. Jen, do you have anything to add to the ask? Yeah, I, I love the example you said. Um, Trin, you, you, you uh, mentioned one time a ex- real life example in your life was uh, a friend that you hadn't seen in many years asked if they could crash at your place while they were traveling through the area where you live. And to, to people like Trin and I, that is incredible. Like we haven't even seen each other in years and you think you can, you, and, and to be clear, we think providing housing for people that need it is amazing. Oh, friend, yeah, the- yeah. Like, but as, from a friend perspective, it is surprising. Like I would never ask someone if I could stay at their place if I hadn't talked to them in many years. Oh yeah, Jen, and also like the ability to live temporarily with another adult for an extended period of time is like a superpower. Like I uh-huh. I am, you know, a guest culture person and I was just like, oh my God, am I going to say yes to this? But I did say no, because I knew that my place was a mess and I did not wish to share it uh, with, with my friend, but I and did. You have, and you have pets. And, yeah, yeah, too many. Apartment. Yeah, I have a, a, a significant number of cats, uh, and, and I just didn't feel like, you know, just juggling all those mammals didn't seem uh, fun to me. Um, but I did offer, I had a counter offer. I was like, you know, I can't have you crash with me. I don't quite have enough room. But what I do have, well, had at the time, it was, has since been stolen. I have a car. I can drive you to your to your venue. Um, we can, you know, grab a drink. Um, I'd love to catch up, that sort of thing. Um, So I tried to find a place in the middle where I wanted to help this person stay in touch, um, you know, show that I appreciate that they reached out to me, but also like, I don't need someone sleeping near me, near me. I feel like the theme we're uncovering here, Trin, is that you're being kind to your friend and being kind to yourself, which is kind of the whole thing in our whole book. It's what we try to, is kind of what we try to preach. And uh, there's also an entire section of our book that's about favors. Um, asking for favors, doing favors for friends, um, how hard it is to ask for, for some people to ask for help. For some people, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, like we were just saying, uh, asking to stay stay over at Trin's, uh, but Trin provided a counter offer. I can't do this, but this is what I can do instead. And we think that's a really good, um, it's a good move. Yeah. Jen, I, I feel like one of the things that we come back on a lot um, in friendshiping is that stating your needs and your boundaries is one of the kindest things you can do for your friends because your friends don't live inside of here. You might think it's really obvious, like, hey, I'm moving and I need somebody to, to pick up my handmade armoire and drag it down three flights of stairs and put it in the alley for me. True story. Thank you, Tomo. I, they don't know these things. You have to say it out loud. Um, and also like your boundaries need to be said out loud. So like maybe uh, my buddy who was coming through town and wanted to stay there uh, for a week, if I did not say out loud, no, thank you. I mean, like, how would that have turned out? We probably would have ended up fighting. I probably would have felt uncomfortable. I probably would have caused a rift in a relationship that actually, funny story, we became closer uh, after that. I, again, I then relayed that correctly. I had not seen this person for 10 years, um, but I now have them as in my periphery, like a, a very cool and interesting person. Um, so yeah, I, I think if you take anything away from this like ask versus guess discussion that we're having right now, it's that again, moderation is usually key and telling people what you need, telling people where your limits are, is just, it's such a, a good idea and a solid move. And it's not, it's not easy to do. Um, but one lesson I've learned over and over again is that even your good friends, even your best friends cannot read your mind. You do have to say what, what your expectations are. I, I, one thing I'm learning that I've learned a lot, um, I'm 30 now, but I've learned uh, throughout my, I learned throughout my twenties was um, f- friendship fights and I, or conflict or resentment often arise when uh, expectations are not communicated. Um, and it's not easy to state your needs. I don't think it comes naturally to a lot of people, especially people that are um, from marginalized groups or underrepresented communities are, are often taught not to say what you need. Um, but a lesson that I've been trying to bring into my own life is uh, it's not impolite to say what you need. It's not impolite to say, um, to use statements that start with the, uh, uh, this is the Midwesternist coming in again, how hard it is to talk about yourself. Um, but it's not impolite to, to use sentences that start with the letter I such as, I'm not really feeling that, or I can't, 
I can't let you stay in my apartment this week, but I would love to catch up with you and consider me your chauffeur. I would be happy to drive you and show you around the city. Yeah, not everybody has the same love language. I know that sounds very Tumblr.com to everybody, but like love languages are a real thing. You know, like some people, uh, they show their love through kind words. They show their love through kind actions or gifts. There's a bunch of them. You can Google love languages. We don't talk about them in the book necessarily, but this is, you know, part of it. Um, you may be saying your needs and boundaries in a language that your friend doesn't understand. Like you might be saying things so gently and so timidly, like actually, if you could, if you maybe, I was just thinking maybe if you would consider not maybe doing that perhaps, that's not stating a need and a boundary. And, uh, and that's hard, it's hard as hell. Like it's not easy. And Jen and I still make these mistakes even though we actually have like listened to these stories over and over and over again and they have the same refrain say your needs and your boundaries clearly. Uh, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, it's really hard. Yeah, I'm going to open the book and flip through it and see what topic we should discuss next. Ooh, how about if I flip through it and whatever page we land on, that's what we'll talk about. Oh man, Jen, it's such a good idea. It's like a random number generator, except it's you in a book. Flip it. <laughs> exactly the same. Okay. Oh, I <laughs> I bookmarked the thing we're going to talk about later. So oh I'm yeah, no, 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 you can't do that. Right, that's no. not gonna, okay, let me try again. If all else fails, I'll repeat that poem that I always do. Oh yeah, okay, here we go. How about, ooh, how about gift giving? Yeah, gift yeah, giving! We have, whole, we have a whole section of the book that's about how difficult and tricky it is. Uh, when It's basically about when capitalism is introduced to uh, friendships. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like capitalism is, we talk about capitalism quite a lot in the book because the way that we structure our society absolutely uh, informs the way that we interact with one another. Um, and we have a society in which making money is the primary driving force. And uh, money can sometimes accidentally be misconstrued as a level of love. Um, it, we one time had a question from uh, a lady who, who was very, very, very friendship endingly upset that their bridesmaid had given them $50 as a gift for their wedding. And Jen and I just, what did we end up deciding? It was just like, like I, we would just, oh, the lady was like, uh, the asker's friend said to the asker, do you want me to chip in for the wedding? And the asker said no. And then the asker was disappointed with the amount of money that she received as a gift. So there were so many like miscommunications happening around there. So many uh, like strange levels of just trying very desperately hard to understand each other. Um, and, and $50 doesn't mean I love you $50 amount. $50 means I have $50 and you can have it. And that's the whole thing. That's yeah, the end. Man, that wedding question that we received, we, uh, we rarely get questions. We often get questions that get us fired up because uh, we care about this topic, but we don't usually get questions that make us like really confused and angry. And this one did. We were really upset with the asker who um, we examined it from every angle. And I even, we don't usually do this, but I showed the question to a couple of friends and I said, what's your read on this? Because I, I'm very confused. And uh, man, it would be funny if that asker was watching this right now. <laughs> I hope, I hope she is, and I hope that she's doing amazing and that she yeah. used that $50 to get something really nice that she likes, and she had a wonderful reconciliation with her friend. Uh, I bet, oh, stay, oh, here's my fanfic. Uh, the asker went on her honeymoon and called her in the middle of Hawaii and said, friend, I forgive you for that $50. And the friend said, I don't know what the hell you're talking about, but I love you too. And then it ended and everything was okay. Yes, exactly. I, uh, I'm pretty confident they're not here watching this because I'm pretty sure we lost them as a listener. In a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's okay. You can't win them all. Um, but but gift giving. Gift giving. Yes. The asker touched on something very complicated and complex. Um, but the first rule that we that we wrote down, and I still stand by this, which is um, you don't have to give gift to your friends. There are a lot yeah. of ways yeah. to show your people that you care and love them and you don't have to spend a single single cent to do it. Yeah, there are, I mean, you don't have to be giving them um, Tiffany boxes and stuff. Um, one thing that you can do is having a, like a very thoughtful gift. Um, I, my like stand in gift for like, uh, I, I want to show this person that I care about them, but I don't know what the hell to do is 
so nobody has printed out photographs really anymore. Like they're all on the internet. Um, and so, um, especially now that we're in COVID and I have so many sweet pictures of me and my friends in the before times, like hanging out and like hugging and stuff. Um, I'll occasionally print those out and send them to people because now they have that and they can put it in their house and they can look at it and remember how like things are great. And that cost me like what, like a dollar 25? Um, just there are the small ways to show that you care. Another good one, um, this happened to me and I was so touched by it that I, that I started to like pass it along as a gift, which is donating to a charity uh, in, your friend, in your friend's name, um, especially a charity that would mean a lot to them. Um, when Trin got married, I donated uh, $69 to a, <laughs> I think it was $69 and 42 cents to a- um, It was. To a charity in Chicago that uh, fosters and takes care of uh, stray cats because that is her passion. I have like so many. I just like, I, I care about mammals, all of them so oh, much. Cat, cats are great. Dogs are great. Humans, they're fine. <laughs> you know, like, okay. Yeah. They, they, can, they have their perks, you know, their yeah. ups and downs. Um, gift giving birthdays. So, like, you know, we just had a holiday, and like holidays give you a certain ob obligation to give gifts to your friends. Um, birthdays are so wacky when you're an adult. You know, it's like we we don't usually have like a cake where we blow out candles and have people sing at us, and then we like open presents in front of them anymore. They typically ended. Um, although, you know, if you can pull that off, like thumbs up to you. Um, we have we send each other a really nice text message on our birthday, yeah, yeah. you know? And if you have different expectations of that on your birthday, well, you better throw yourself a party because your friends don't know that that's what you want. Oh man, that's so true, Trin. If you have, if you are giving a gift for your friend and you've never given them a gift before on their birthday, I would personally give them a heads up. So they don't, um, especially, especially if it's not a birthday, especially if it's like a holiday, because they're going to be like, wait, I didn't get you anything. Uh, uh. Uh, I remember the first time, um, uh, it was when I, uh, it was before I, I was dating my husband, um, we were dating at the time and I, uh, I got him like his favorite candy or something. I just like grabbed something, uh, off, off the shelf at Walgreens. Uh, I paid for it. I didn't steal it. It sounds like I stole it. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, we got, he like picked me up and I got in the car and I went, Hey, I got you something. And he, uh, typical Midwesterner paled, he went pale and he went, I didn't get you anything. And I go, no, 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 no. Like, I, it's just a random thing. I just like, I just grabbed some candy for you. It's not a big deal. But um, you can really uh, freak people out if you give them gifts, um, especially if they, uh, if they are uh, expensive seeming. Um, people, people are really uh, understandable, complicated things about giving and receiving gifts. Some people just don't want gifts ever because it makes them feel so weird. I have a couple of friends like that. Like the expectation is, please don't get me anything. My brother and I uh, have a, a new understanding as of, I think when, I want to say it was two years ago, where we specifically do not give each other gifts on holidays and birthdays. We give each other gifts when we feel like it and like I when we that. see a thing. I love it too. It's so much better. And then on Christmas, we can just be like, hey, what's up? Let's talk about that weird blender that you got from our mom this year. That was pretty strange. You know, like it's, <laughs> it's nice. Like, and then, and then we also like, we have a... Um, it, it's nice to have an understanding that it's not freaking strange for me to pick up uh, this painting of a pig that a child did for the Esperanza community. I center. remember when you bought yeah. that. That I was think, so sweet. It, it's, a, it's a really ugly but beautiful painting that was worth every 75 buck that <laughs> went to that charity. I'll tell you yeah. what. But like that's, that's the beauty of it is you do get to make up your own rules. You just have to actually state those rules. And speaking of rules and changing expectations and things like that, Jen, one thing that I love to talk about in our podcast is how people tend to get into certain patterns with their friends that they want to get out of and they don't know how. Oh, this is so good. This is especially common in old friendships, um, but for, it can happen in any kind of friendship and every friendship is a little bit different. But we've noticed, certainly in my own life, friendships that you've had since like elementary school, high school, college... Um, your first job, whatever. Um, some behaviors and jokes and, and patterns kind of are grandfathered in. And over the years, you kind of realize, I don't really like, I don't really like that anymore. I don't really like being teased about, about the fact that I'm bald. I don't really like being teased about this particular thing or whatever it is. Um, you start to notice, uh, you start to notice like, hey, this, this thing that's always been accepted, I don't really need to accept it anymore. So Trin, what do you do in that situation? Well, Jen, it's extremely difficult and emotionally hard, but 
at the end of the day, it actually is an extremely healthy thing and an important thing to do. Um, you first, I would say, look for somebody else in the group that you think might be sympathetic to your cause. So say uh, every Saturday night, you and your friends get together to play Mario Kart 64 and binge drink, and you are just not having it anymore. It's like, can we please just do something else on Friday nights? Uh, and you've noticed that your buddy Jen is kind of rolling her eyes every time somebody picks Toad because she obviously gets Toad. And why is everybody stepping, stepping on her Toads? <laughs> anyway, uh, the point is, well, it's, it's nice to find a sympathetic ear, somebody to back you up so that you're not going into this conversation being like, I and I alone would like to try Netflixing instead of playing Mario Kart 64. It can be good to have somebody to back you up. And the conversation just kind of goes like this. It's, hey, I know we've been doing this forever. And I know that I, I've obviously been participating in it, um, but I just feel like we should change things up. I'd like things to be a little bit different. Um, I, I know that like I laugh along when you make fun of my giant teeth. I, I think my teeth are huge. I don't know, my brother gave me this complex. It's not, nice. <laughs> <laughs> right? I know. Uh, it's like, I, I know I used to like play along when you said that my teeth were the size of the business end of a spatula. I, I thought that was very funny. But here's the thing, it's to the point now where I just feel like we could change up the dynamic. Like let's like roasting and pranking each other. Let's let's try it on a different level. Let's try instead of Mario Kart 64, how about some GoldenEye? We got a freaking Nintendo 64 here. Let's just like go for it. You oh know? man, GoldenEye song, that game was so fun. Um, so the important part I think is stating that you're you're asking for a change and you can't really expect your friends to read your mind and know that you want to change without saying so and um one thing we do in the book is we provide scripts or ideas for how to start because in my opinion starting the conversation is always the hardest part and then you 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 say the thing that makes you uncomfortable and then you often feel better about it you're often like oh that wasn't so bad as i thought and sometimes it is it goes really bad i mean let's be realistic some not all conversations go well uh but these are your friends and they're your friends for a reason so um our advice for situations like these is to say like acknowledge that you're asking for something different which might be like hey i know um we've been i've been having a lot of fun um every friday when we when binge drink but i was wondering what if we uh what if we watched a movie instead? Or what if we went out? Or what if we uh, invited all of our significant others? Or what if we had a dinner party? Or what if we did this? And the truth is you might have to do some of the legwork. If you're asking for something new, you might have to be the one that, if you're asking for new plans, you might have to form those plans. You might have to do the brainstorming and uh, the cooking or whatever it is. Um, but really the, the heart of this is staying, uh, asking for a change and uh, I also like what you mentioned earlier, Trent, about um, maybe cluing in someone in the group. And it's not like you're talking behind anyone's back. You're just kind of like, hey, what do you think about um, uh, if I asked so-and-so to, uh, you know, drop that whole uh, bit they do where they make fun of Trent's teeth? <laughs> I'm sorry, Trent. And I'd be like, thumbs up. I'm in. <laughs> You'd be like, no, I really like making fun of Trin's teeth. So it's I think we should keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just such a safe topic. It's not like I'm making, she's, it's like whatever. And like the other thing that I think is like super important to acknowledge is if you've participated in the thing, and if you've been somebody who has helped the continuation of the thing, you got to acknowledge that, you know, like if you were part of the, I love how the topic is like making fun of my teeth, but like really this can apply to like problematic behaviors within your friend group, which like, you know that they exist, okay? Uh, and you can say like, hey, I know that I've been kind of playing along with this, but I've had to think about it and I really think that we should change. And that's how you keep your friends because your friends cannot be expected to behave perfectly 100% of the time. They will, they will mess up. They will do things that you don't like. Yeah, that's a really good point. For people, you gotta tell them. Your friends are people and people are imperfect and so are you. Hey, while we're on the topic of roasting and cranking, uh, what if we read that part real quick? Oh man, what page is that? It's like early in the book, page right? Page 12. Page 12. Oh man, I have a copy that we signed. This is so weird. It's so messed up that we wrote a book, you know, man. So uh, do you feel like each of us do one of the bullets? Yeah, totally did. Do you want to start? Yeah. Okay. This section is a sidebar in the book and it is called roasting and pranking, a nuanced love language. Friends can make fun of each other without being cruel. Just remember first. Uh, 
<laughs> avoid any, I'll read this first one, sorry, Sharon. Yeah, I was like, I'm not sure, but you, you, you go, yeah. Okay, just remember, avoid any potential, potentially harmful or sensitive topics based on the individual. If you don't already have an understanding of what's funny to them and what hurts, you are not ready to roast this friend. Know the difference between exchanging wits and being hurtful. Make sure your friend is laughing sincerely and jabbing back at you. Make it affectionate. Roasts are usually compliments in comedic disguises. You can tease your friends about their meaningless, harmless quirks like this one. Jen cannot remember the names or faces of extremely famous actors. She really can't. She can never remember <laughs> what movies Clint Eastwood has done. Willem Dafoe? Never heard of the guy. Friends quiz her on this to see what wild answers she will conjure because they know she doesn't mind. That's true. I, uh, I don't, I have face blindness toward almost all famous people. And uh, I forget, even if I've seen a movie 10 times, I'll be like, I've never seen that guy before. And, and <laughs> my friends will be like, we watched that last week. What are you talking about? Um, ooh, sorry, I think you can hear my dog. Here. Train, why don't you read the next one while the dogs go crazy? Happy to do it, babe. Uh, if you're roasting a friend because they have a weird habit, frame it as special and interesting. We have a pal who prefers cereal instead of croutons in his salad. Cereal. It's all about the texture, apparently. Yeah, that's my friend Garson. Trin, can you keep reading while I get the dogs to shut up? <laughs> Absolutely, babe. Uh, last one. Roasting, <laughs> this is funny because we actually talk about the, the teeth here. Roasting invites consequences. One time, Trin's brother made fun of her big teeth. One time, it was not one time, but whatever. In turn, I chewed up a sleeve of Oreos and spit them all over his bed. <laughs> you I, you got a revenge. I think you did good. Yeah, I did have to clean it up though. I got to tell you, like it, when you, it was a really, an, it was an entire sleeve of Oreos. And uh, what I did was <clears throat> I kind of like chipmunked them, you know, so like one hand Oreo and then like, just like, like a constant rotation of like in input and output. Uh, That's amazing. And, then, and then I did this. I went. <laughs> <laughs> That is, um, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. I think, uh, I think you, you kind of reap what you sow there, don't you? Cause you had to clean it up. <laughs> I did. Do you want to hear about another horrible thing I did to my brother? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so he was again, making fun of my teeth and please never do this to yourself. It is such a bad idea. So I, he had a, ce a ceiling fan in his bedroom. And so what I did is I turned the fan on as high as it would go, but hit the light switch off so that when he turned it on, it would start spinning. But what I did was I put soap all over the top of the blades. That's genius. It's oh, also so bad. so bad. A lot of it like fell off. Before. Like what kind of soap? Like bars of soap? Like great question. It was a Dawn liquid dish detergent, and uh, getting dish detergent out of a carpet is not easy, and it is something that I had to do for several hours. <laughs> so, so that's it. You know, like not only do you reap what you roast, as we say. You also like reap what you you prank or like roast back. So like, be careful, guys. Like, don't use Oreos and Dawn dish detergent and you oh, prank some roasts. Oh man, so good though. I oh, know, like it good felt inspiring. good. Yeah. Don't do it though, Jen. Don't. Do okay, it. so we have twenty minutes left. So here's what I think we should do. I think we should read a little bit more from the book about long distance yeah. friends, and then I think we should take some questions. I love that idea, Jen. Where the hell is ninety six? Right. It's page 87 in the book, actually. 87. Yeah. I was very close, but no cigar. Cool. Um, my dog seems to have calmed down. Um, if she goes wild again, I will mute and Trin will take over. <laughs> tag in. No big deal yeah. at all. You want to start? Yeah. Okay. So this is a part in the book that's called The Care and Keeping of Long Distance Friendships. And I think pretty much everyone is in a long distance friendship right now. I love this art, too, by Jane Way. Jane yeah, Way is at canned cabbage on Twitter and her work is outstanding. Anyway. When long distance enters a friendship, your relationship will evolve and change. Fortunately, this does not signal the end of the friendship. It just signals a new kind of friendship. Our first piece of advice, find the absolute easiest, least complicated way for you to talk. One that works for all parties. Before the move happens, you may be tempted to establish strict keep in touch plans that you have not tested out. like. We will play co-op computer games and shout at each other online every weekend or email me every single time you go on a date and spare no details or we will gab on the phone every Sunday night for 45 minutes for our mandatory catch-up time. 
We understand why you'd want to make plans ahead of time. You want reassurance that you'll stay close, but your plans might not pan out so well in reality. If you miss a phone call or an email, you'll feel guilty. Or what if you're just not in the mood to chat when Sunday night rolls around? Make it as easy as possible on yourself and your friend to connect. Catch up in a way that is low stress, allows for flexibility, and doesn't come with obligation. Uh, and I'll go ahead and finish out the page. And when you do connect with one another, recognize how awesome that is. Now that you are long distance, the little things, emails, comments on your social media, the short and sweet text messages, these matter more. When your friend takes time from their busy and far away life to reach out to you, that should mean a little more than just any old text message. You're on their mind, how nice. And when they cross your mind, tell them so. Your friendship can survive a change of scenery, but prepare for an adjustment period as you find your sea legs. Here are some other ideas for staying close with that long distance friend. Examine your own communication habits. If you don't regularly ask questions like, what's new with you? How are you? How was your day? Now is the perfect time to add these to your, to add these friendly phrases to your vocabulary. Do you tend to ignore your phone? We don't blame you for that. Or you rarely, rarely answer texts, change it up. If you're not much of a sharer, it's time to get in the habit of talking about your life. You may not be well practiced with sharing because your friend is usually there to live it with you, but that's not true anymore. Give updates, send photos, talk about how your spouse is doing, the furniture you're painting, the new brewery you toured, the job you're going to apply for. It doesn't have to be over a phone call. Don't strain yourself to use the phone if you don't like talking on the phone, but you can just safely assume your friend cares about what is happening in your life. But be prepared for some FOMO. That means fear of missing out. When you see glimpses of your friend's life on social media surrounded by people you've never met and looking like they're having a great time, your first reaction might be sadness and jealousy. Now you're finding out they're starring in the local production of Peter Pan through a Facebook status update? How dare they not call you? A little jealousy is normal, but you need to chill out and not act on it. Your friend doesn't need to hit pause on their life just because you're not there. Exactly. And understand that your friend will make new friends. At some point, you may notice that your friend is somehow doing fine without you nearby. Maybe that makes you feel relieved and delighted on their behalf, or maybe it makes you feel a little bit sad, like you're on the sidelines instead of in the game with them. But the sidelines are very important. That's where your teammates rest between plays, cheering you on. You're still a crucial member of the team, even if you're on the bench. That's a sports metaphor. I didn't get it at first, but Jen explained it to me as she is the resident jock. It's true. <laughs> um, I love that right after this, we get into cactus friends, which I think is a great thing to talk about uh, pandemic wise. But yeah, let's do it. Do we, do we want to talk about that and then do questions or do we? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about cactus friends for a little bit. And then I see we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A and John will lead us through that. But yeah, first let's talk about what a cactus friend is. Yeah. So I love plants. I think you could probably tell by, this is, this is just some of my plants. And then also like you can see my, my filthy, this is all of like the empty pots and stuff. I just, I'm, I'm a, that's probably loud. I'm a weird plant person. Um, you might think I'm a crazy cat lady. Untrue, I am a weird plant person first and foremost. Uh, and what I know about plants is this, cactuses don't need a lot of water. In fact, if you are someone like me who loves to just like touch and play with your plants, you will kill them. You will kill them. You will kill them so much. Uh, and then there are other plants like uh, low-lying rainforest plants like uh, phytonias or the plant that we use in the book is the orchid. Uh, orchids need a lot of misting. They got special needs for watering, um, but they uh, produce beautiful flowers when tended to correctly. And the same is true actually for cacti. Lots of cacti flower if you take care of them correctly. What's important about this weird metaphor is this. Cactus friends don't need a lot of watering. In fact, if you bugaboo them a little bit too much, they might not like it too much and, and they will wilt. Orchid friends uh, require those little text messages. They require those Zoom calls, um, but they reward you with a beautiful friendship. 
Um, and we all fall somewhere in there. Uh, Jen and I both consider ourselves cactus friends. Um, one of my other best friends in the world, Carlin, I call a philodendron friend because uh, you, if you plant people, if you, if you know what I'm talking about, philodendrons can grow freaking anywhere. High light, low light, spritzing, no spritzing, humidity, no humidity. What kind of soil? Doesn't matter. It's going to grow. Um, there are people like that too. Um, but getting to know who you are and what you need from your friends is so important because then you can tell them. And I can tell my friends, hey, I'm a cactus friend. You, you, don't, you don't need to worry about me, okay? We're, I know I haven't heard from you for a couple of weeks, but like, we're cool, all right? I'll hear from you when you've got the spoons. Yeah, but I do. Yeah. <laughs> or you can say like, hey, I don't have any energy to, to talk, but I just want to drop you a line and say like, I'm thinking of you and I'm looking forward to our Zoom call this weekend. Like you can check in without getting pulled into uh, a long discussion or conversation or something like that. Like cactus friends need... Uh, need less interaction. They, uh, they value their alone time. It's kind of like being introverted or extroverted. Um, and I think everyone somewhere, somewhere falls in there. I don't know, you can be a little, a little bit of both. You can be neither depending on the day. Uh, but what's been so hard about the pandemic is everyone's kind of learning how to be uh, a cactus friend. Everyone's learning and people are, have to be cactus friends because they can't see people in person. Um, so I think that's been, it's been a, certainly one of the many strains on people uh, yeah. during COVID. Uh, I sorry. I just wanted to point out that my cat is lurking in the in the corner. Also, um, one thing that we found um, from a lot of people um, asking us questions on the show is they're they're finding that they are more of a cactus friend than they thought they were, mm -hmm. and they're wondering if that's okay. They're like, well, what's going to happen if like I'm enjoying all this alone time? I like my solitude, and we're going to come out of the pandemic, and all of a sudden I got to go places again. Well, you don't. You don't have to. Um, you can learn about yourself through this shelter in place, learn how you, you feel better in the world and then act on it. And, and you're going to be okay, buddy. Yeah. I, uh, I saw a tweet the other day from, I, I can't remember her name, but she was saying um, she, she never realized just how overextended she was until shelter in place happened. And then she was like, oh man, I have way more energy than I did before because I'm not spending it on going to social events that I maybe feel 50% like going, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I think that's a, a realization for a lot of people. Um, Trin, how do you feel about moving over to the Q&A? I love that idea. <laughs> hey, John. Hey. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for the, that wonderful conversation and the readings. And we've got a few great questions. And I think I'm going to ask the, the one that ties in perhaps most directly to what you're just talking about with Orchid Friends and Cactus Friends. And the viewer asks, what do you have to say about the uh, effort to overcome our busy, uh, otherwise engaged, exhausted lives so often getting in the way of spending time and doing things together with friends as opposed to merely texting. Is spending time together still relevant nowadays? What an interesting question. Is spending time together still relevant now these days? So I, it depends on what you mean spending by spending time together. So Jen and I, I think would say that playing friends with our game, uh, playing friends with our games, playing games with our friends online counts to us. It feels like hanging out with our friends to us. Um, I would say that we are the kind of people who, you know, we get a text message from one of our friends we haven't heard from in a long time. And like that really, we weigh that heavily. That feels really good. It feels like they're there because we don't see people. Um, so the question of is hanging out with people is being together like irrelevant. It's not, and it's going to come back, you know, at some point it has to. Um, and in fact, in some ways it's here, you know, people who are not paying attention to shelter in place, but also people who are having their birthday around a bonfire, you know, like my buddy Corey did, which was amazing because fire burns germs and you stay 10 feet away from each other. It's perfect. Um, I, it's not going to go away. You know, events will still be around. Jen, did I understand the question correctly? What do you, what do you vibe on so, this? Yeah, I think so. My read on it is, um, hanging out. <laughs> Here's what I think. I think friendship is, uh, one of many ingredients to a healthy and happy life. It's not the only ingredient. Um, it is, uh, companionship can take many forms and companionship to some people might mean, uh, you talk to your friend once a week. It might mean you see this person uh, once a month at the dog park and you say hello. That might be enough socialization. That person is still a friend, you know? One thing we really emphasize in the book, and it's taken me a long time to, to fully grasp myself in my own life, is friendships look different on everybody. Um, 
So if you are not someone who is attending many Zoom calls right now or many digital happy hours or whatever, um, that's there's nothing wrong with you, okay? <laughs> I mean, uh, there's nothing wrong with that inherently. Um, maybe there's some changes you wanna make in your life. Maybe you do wanna be someone who attends Zoom calls and that's certainly attainable. Um, but if your friendship doesn't look like uh, my friendship with Trin, if it doesn't look like uh, a friendship that you see other people having, that's not inherently bad, you know? Like um, every individual relationship is gonna look a little bit different and you really don't know what's going on unless you're the people inside of it. Um, so yeah, I guess I would say hanging out with friends is important, but um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't place so much emphasis on what you see other people doing, especially right now, because um, these are weird times. <laughs> Yeah, I also wanted to uh, mention, because I don't know how old the asker is, and we probably don't have time to find out, but <laughs> when you're a kid and you hang out with your friends outside of school, that's, that's wild. It's like, oh my God, I get, to, I get to be around a person that's not my family. Like the, the very act of itself, of being with somebody who you just see in school is interesting and, and weird and cool. And, and then in college, it's like, oh my gosh, we get to drink? together in the same place like whoa and like it's not that like you know the veneer of that falls off it's just that like you know there are more experiences to have in life so if you find yourself growing older and not wanting to like hang out and party and stuff it's not that you know hanging out is silly or relevant or not important it's just that it it has a different meaning and a different importance now um the end the next question um What's your advice about intergenerational friendships, making them, keeping them from feeling weird? They sound good in theory and the benefit seems real, but they can feel a little difficult. It's a oh cool boy. question. It's such yeah. a question. So I feel elderly. I've, I've, I'm only five years older than Jen, but I, I have always felt like, you know, pretty elderly. And one thing that I've had to work on really hard, because I do have friends who are younger than me, uh, is to make sure that I'm not acting like the big brother, you know, that I'm not acting like that older sibling, because that's not what this is. When you are friends with somebody intergenerationally, you have to keep that power dynamic in mind. Age is a power dynamic and it doesn't go away, you know, um, and, and that, that interplays with your friendship on a number of levels. One, you got to make sure you're not overly giving advice. Um, I once had an older friend uh, that I had to bounce because uh, he was just correcting me all of the time. Uh, he was like, I want to say like 10 years older than me. And just, I felt like I could not do anything without his input. And, and I just couldn't do it anymore. Um, but I agree with you. Intergenerational, intergenerational friendships are great. And, you know, there are some very fun Zoomers, some very fun Gen Xers. Uh, and, I, and I don't know why I'm assuming you're a millennial, but maybe you are. But I do think that it is good to have those friendships. But you, again, you can't let go of the fact that, especially if you're the older one, that that exists. Jen, anything you want to add? Yeah, I think you nailed it. Um, I have a couple friends that are old, not just Trin, um, but like uh, someone, a colleague of mine is 10 years older than me. And I consider her a mentor. And uh, I also consider her a friend. But the mentor thing we agreed upon, <laughs> because we are in the same uh, field. She's a very experienced uh, journalist. Um, she's some she's someone I really look up to professionally and personally. Um, and we had a discussion like, will you be my business mentor? <laughs> Um, and she's someone that we, I would talk to all the time, not about work, but we do have set times where I ask her like, Hey, is now a good, like, this is our set zoom this week where I'm asking you questions about what it's like to like, like work and job and writing and editing and those kind of things. Um, anyway, what I'm getting at is, uh, you can't, you can't ask, you can't assume someone is your mentor and you can't be someone's mentor without, uh, permission. Man, Jen, what a really good point. I, um, let me tell you about one of my many screw ups. Uh, for a long time, I had a friend who I was, I felt we were so close. Um, they were so dear to me, uh, but it ended up that, um, first of all, they were way younger than I thought they were. Uh, and I, they saw me as a mentor. They saw me as somebody who was ahead of them in our industry, who was um, in an advice giver. And it kind of took me aback to be like, oh, whoa, we're not bros. And I'm gonna carry that with me, you know, and I'm gonna go <clears throat> further into my relationships and, and bear in mind that 
no matter what you do, if you're the older person in that relationship, you do have a certain amount of power and you have to check it and you have to remember that it doesn't go away. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, that's exactly it. I have also been in a situation where I um, had more uh, influence and power over a friend group than I realized because I don't, just because you don't feel particularly knowledgeable, powerful, influential, which I do not <laughs> on any given day. I just, I just, I'm me. Okay. I'm just a weird weirdo. Um, but you may be surprised by um, how, how closely people look to you, how, how closely people listen, how people are looking to you. And uh, I guess the lesson is your behavior matters. <laughs> and I think we, we have, have time. Four? We have four. Yeah. Minutes left. Okay, cool. We got one, one last question. Um, and I think it's a good one to end on. What's the most important lesson about friendship that you've learned from personal experience? Oh man, I think I just stated mine, which was I, I need to um, be more aware of my own. Oh wait, I have one, hold on. Uh, this is a small thing because um, I, I could answer this question and it would take me hours. Um, you have to read the book to get the full answer. Uh, so buy it from this bookstore <laughs> for I think $14.99. Um, anyway, I think my answer is um, I spent a lot of, uh, particularly my young 20s, uh, but certainly all through uh, my teenage years and in my 20s, uh, thinking that if I canceled or didn't show up to a thing, it wouldn't matter. Um, I bailed constantly. And I could easily talk myself into canceling events, not showing up, um, bailing at the last minute. Um, and then it was actually through my friendship and like before, like uh, doing this podcast and talking to Trin and making this uh, a weekly discussion in my life that I realized actually uh, my presence matters. Uh, it matters when I show up to places. Um, it's also, and, and this isn't to say it's not okay to bail. We have a whole section in our book giving you permission to not go to things leave events, go to bed early, do whatever you need to do. I'm just talking about my personal experience, which is um, it is okay to push yourself out the door and you don't have to wait for someone to beg you to be there. <laughs> no, Jen, I totally agree. And in fact, that was actually what I was going to say. So I'm kind of like, okay. it's oh, okay. that's so funny. I'm yeah. like, I'm like I going think, through I think the lesson is we're learning, you know, it takes a long time to, to kind of learn your worth as a friend and you never really stop learning it. Absolutely. Like you don't know what your meaning is in somebody else's life. And it's probably immense. Um, one thing that uh, I think about a lot uh, is social media. Uh, and we talk about social media a lot um, on the show. And I wouldn't say this is like one of my foundational lessons or, or anything, but I think this is one that's worth sharing and something that I did learn, which is like, you know, when somebody even follows you on Twitter, it is not a wholesale rejection of you as a person. It is just, I specifically do not want to interact with you on this format. Uh, and it could be as simple as you post a lot of anime boobs. It could be as simple as you post a lot of food pictures. It could be as simple as you post too much and, and you don't need to change what you're doing. Um, you just uh, have to accept that your friend is curating their experience on that social media. Um, so yeah, so although I 100% <laughs> I, I agree with Jen, like I was a huge, I was a bailer. I was, I bagged, I was bagger vance. I just never, never showed up. Um, but, and I, cause I didn't think it mattered. You know, I didn't think people cared if I was there or not. And, and to this day, that is something that I, that I think about a lot. Um, but yeah, but also social media. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. The Twitter question is good. Cause we kind of bookended it. Cause we mentioned that in the beginning. So good job. Trin. Hey, we did amazing. Honestly, this whole thing was a hundred percent excellent. <laughs> Start to finish. Thank you very much for having us. This has been so fun. Yeah. Thank you both. Yeah, we're at the top of the hour, so it's it's time to go. But uh, Trin and Jen, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'll drop the link in the chat one more time if you'd like to buy Friendship Being from Motor Audio Bookstore. We can ship it to you anywhere in the United States. We're going to pick it up at this store. Um, but Trin and Jen, please continue to stay safe and be well. And to all of our attendees, thank you for being here. And please continue to stay safe and be well as well. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. And thank you for your questions. They were wonderful. Take care. Bye,